All right, it looks like we are officially live. If you are checking this out on YouTube after the fact, be sure to just fast forward. Oh, let's say about 10 minutes. We'll get started officially. And if you're just logging on, happy to have you here. And uh, let us know where you're coming from. We got a whole bunch of great questions. So looking forward to uh, trying to cover as much of that as I can. And ignore me, I'm having my herbal snacks. I foolishly delayed dinner until after this today. Let us know if you get on here. As usual, I have no idea what I'm doing. So I don't know how many people we got on at any given time. Ba, ba, ba. Oops, and I forgot to do something, so I am jumping on here. free to go ahead and post something in the chat and um, we will do our very best to get it in there all right if we're lucky we actually have I got somebody here so let us know who you are where you're calling from Sorry, I didn't mean to abandon everybody there. Um, uh oh, somebody's spamming me and I can't answer right now. So hope you can jump on and <laughs> Yay, somebody else is here. So, promise to I think drive to Orlando today. I don't actually remember where she was heading. So uh, if you're just now jumping on here, you can catch the recording um, on YouTube and just go ahead and fast forward about 10 minutes from the beginning and you can jump right in. But needless to say, we love everybody who's actually online. Looks like our connection may be a little iffy today. <laughs> I put, switched it over to my phone, so. I don't know how to do what it just said for me to do. Uh, all right. It looks like we're doing better, though, now. Something about frame rate. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Fifteen to sixty. If I show you how to do that, I will do that. So, I do not see how to do that. I have no idea. So one of these days I'll watch up. Ooh, wait, maybe this is it. Ha! Hopefully I won't lose anything. If anybody is just jumping on, let us know who you are and where you're hailing from no that's not anything that i know how to do <laughs> all right nope i'm going to try really hard not to screw all of this up so i'm going to stop trying to do anything so oops.
We exist. Yeah. Here it is. I'm going to stop. Ooh, I'm yes. About the delay. Yeah, and you got to turn <laughs> the volume down. Yeah. <laughs> or all hell's going to break loose. And needless to say, if you need the um, pluggy anything, uh, just Great. steal it from me. Yeah, okay. well, I'm almost up to 100%. Okay. I just tried to print. Oh, yeah, the midwife. Sometimes it just prints random stuff. Yeah, like later, and it's less tired. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, there's the one. All the right. Is, uh, Looks like we got everybody on here. People are showing up. Yay! We'll get started in about four minutes. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna try that one and see how it goes. All right, I'm almost just done snacking on my steam Solomon seal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll get real food afterwards. Well, hopefully the rest of the gang, it looked like we had a good crowd showing up tonight. Hopefully they will log on, although I think this is always random. And if you're just jumping on, please feel free to intro yourself and uh, let us know where you hail from. And know that you can always catch this after. All right, I have my liquids. I think I'm ready. We got Trisha here to help Yay. with all the cool questions. We'll have you intro yourself in a minute. Okay. It's my panorama there. <laughs> <It's very fancy>. <laughs> <laughs> ah, good to see you here again, Jeremiah. You've been making all Yay. of these late lists. Yes. And, you know, folks, we've actually got a uh, dog question today. I know you, I think that was you who uh, hailed with us for the uh, pet care class a while back. So uh, we've got an interesting doggy question. Oh, I got a gang on here. the questions. So I wonder you, if we're on the same internet. No, I got on my phone. Uh oh. So you might need to back off and Kick online. Well, it says it's waiting for you. No, I still exist. <laughs> I got peeps. Hmm. Now it's back on. So. Okay. Oh, that was really weird. Yeah. The internet's been a little funky today. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've learned now that I must not trust the internet. I no. go to the phone. <laughs> All right. I have one minute left. Here. We're going to put it on you for just a second. Okay. Right. Refill the water. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. <laughs> It's six o'clock. We're getting started. 
So if you don't know, I'm Bob Lindy from the Tradition School of Herbal Studies and Acupuncture and Herbal Therapies. And helping me out this evening is... Trisha. Hi, Trisha. How are you? <laughs> I'm the school director here. And she's going to be the one who will be ch typing furiously in the chat if anybody puts anything in there. And... Uh, Oh, she's got all my questions organized over there. We've probably got more questions tonight from different people than we've ever had before. So super excited about the evening. And, you know, got to do this selfless plug. So um, we've got a bunch of classes coming up. The Chinese program is either full or almost full. Um, we might have one slot yeah, left in the Chinese that starts in uh, about a month. And uh, yeah. we've got... Yes, yeah. this week, Thursday. And uh, the Western Herbal 101 is coming up, looks like November 27, 28, which is the, the entry point for the uh, Western Herbal program this weekend. You can do this online or in person. Uh, is Herbal First Aid, so uh, you don't have to be enrolled in any of the other programs. You can do that as a standalone. And we cover a bazillion herbs. We're going to be talking about home first aid, more wilderness uh, first aid, and uh, then more festival and protest first aid. So we kind of hit a couple of different points and definitely unique areas for each one of those. And of course, coming up and that's once a month as well soups actually this i lied this thursday <laughs> is uh medicine making it's okay the soups and broths so uh, correct the, myself yeah <laughs> I'm all right that cheap. <laughs> yeah right ah, i told you i was gonna put you on the spot for all of that so all of our classes these days are both online and in person uh we do limit the number of people in person just to make sure we're not sitting on top of each other um, and, uh, you know, if you sign up for those ahead of time, it's always good to sign up ahead of time. The classes have been yes, filling up lately. And for the teachers, especially, and the apothecary staff, it's super important that they get materials together so we know how many people we've got to make weirdness for. Um, I don't know. If... Uh, Um, whole family got COVID um, and it's been eight weeks dealing with inconsistent symptoms, um, stiffness, pressure in the head, pain behind the eyes, um, achy head, leaky nose, uh, taking fire cider. Um, let's see what else. And it's now just pressure in the ear is the biggest hassle, okay. I think, isn't it? Let me see. It's, it's a long one. <laughs> Uh, throat spray they're taking, yeah. healthy oil bee bomb. So let me talk about the ear a little bit, just because... Well, keep looking. Yeah, <laughs> feel free to chime in something else as yes. it comes along. Once the ear, um, the the even the outer ear, but especially middle and inner ear, the eustachian tube, um, which is kind of like the tube that goes from the inside of the ear and connects into the throat allows us to equalize the pressure when you're going up in a plane or if you're diving to the deep end of the sw swimming pool. It's that eustachian tube that allows the, the pressure to equalize. It's a pain when that gets screwed up. And, you know, the, the doctors will throw antibiotics and steroids at you and, and those definitely will give some short-term relief. Um, and not out of the question to do that once if necessary. But the reality is what we, we always forget
bacteria that are in our gut. We, we have them on our skin, but we have them in our nose or in the vagina. Well, they're also in your eustachian tube. And the problem with the eustachian tube is it's not easily circulating very well. So once that gets out of whack, we oftentimes run into problems where that's out of balance. There may be a fungal buildup in there and any other number of things, and, and as well as some congenital issues. Uh, that can throw a monkey wrench in scar tissue and so forth that, that may cause a problem. So we have to think about a couple things when we're dealing with that area, the ear or the eustachian tube, where there's not great circulation, it's hard to get the microbiome affected in there. And it's even challenging for the MDs. When they're, they're looking at things, uh, they have a hard time. They, they're not able to go in there. Uh-oh, they're getting lousy reception on me. Um, and that might, we, we had, uh, we still had a client checking out, so that might have been throwing a monkey wrench in there a little bit too, that it was coming in garbled. Yeah. All right. It looks okay on this end now. All right, good. Well, I'm going to keep trying. Hopefully it'll get better right. as the day goes on. Um, so one of the things I always start with, and even though um, the person who sent this question, case it was COVID, uh, a viral infection. And so lots of different ways that that can be uh, addressed. Yeah, Melissa, we, we are having some weird weather. Um, we just had a, a really good cold front come through here with some rain and a lot of wind. So that may be throwing a monkey wrench in there. Um, so hopefully it gets better as time goes on. Um, so when we're affecting the either trying to kill off the viruses, whether we're uh, changing the way that they can reproduce or replicate, uh, and lots of other ways that we can approach killing or slowing down a virus, um, we also can screw up that, that biome of any of our mucous membranes. So in the same way that if we had taken antibiotics, Here in a case like this, but you know, just take your regular oral uh, probiotics. You know, and if you're like being hardcore about it, look at your fermented foods um, a, as a minimum for that. But I actually do like a, a good uh, broad spectrum probiotic as part of that help in trying to get things balanced out. We can. Um, especially because I think she described it as being very full and kind of like humming, but sometimes stabbing. And, and so we kind of look at this idea and it's funny, it's going to be the phlegm two hour session today because a lot of the questions that came up today were all about uh, what we call a wetness or dampness or phlegm. And, um, when we start to get Uh, that it's causing pressure. In Chinese medicine, we would actually say that's a stuck or blood uh, stagnation condition. So in a case like this, we have to really look at the constitution of the individual. Um, I know who wrote this, uh, and so they tend towards some phlegminess, but there's also uh, a level of dryness. So if something is dried and sticky and hard, sometimes we have to moisten it. So we're using those mucilage Tucola is one of my favorites uh, to utilize. Oh, I see some new names on here. Yay. Mm -hmm. um, Go to Cola is one of my favorite because it's an anti-inflammatory. It has an affinity to the head in general. Um, and for any kind of connective tissue inflammation, it's always a winner. Generally, I'm going to say safe. For this particular person, I know it's safe. She might even have some. Um, one that we have to be a little bit more careful, but uh, might also be a good choice. It also guides to the head and is dry in its nature and specific for phlegm. And that's um, ginkgo biloba. 
Um, and ginkgo, we do have some cautions with that. So if somebody uh, is on blood thinners, um, we need to stay away from ginkgo. It does affect that. Or if they don't have phlegm, like if somebody has got a red tongue with or if they have blood pressure, uh, high blood pressure that's not being well controlled, um, then I won't use that. Because of that upward energy, it can um, not necessarily raise the blood pressure significantly, but it can increase it some. Um, it, it's funny, the other thing, and I never recommend this, but in this case, I may, um, ear candling. And so people do the ear candles, you can buy them in a number of different shops, you can find them online. Um, all of that goop you're getting out is probably not any relationship to your ears whatsoever, but I've had them done to me, I've done them to other people, they feel wonderful. Um, and mostly what they're doing is uh, providing a gentle heat into the uh, outer ear, which is improving the uh, blood circulation. And so by increasing the blood circulation to that area, we can do some tissue repair and try to move out some of those fluids. Um, this particular case does not sound like uh, otitis or uh, media, which is the external ear infection. This sounds more like probably middle ear or like I said, the eustachian tube. Um, if it was uh, an external ear infection, there's a classic uh, ear formula that you can use that you can find in usually clean it up. You can create that yourself, but I find it's easier sometimes, hey Babsy, I find it's easier sometimes to uh, just go ahead and buy some from your local store. Um, mullen flour is unique uh, to, to try to gather, so yeah. down here it's a little harder to catch. Hopefully that helped a little bit, um, and sometimes it just takes time, and those probiotics can really make a, a big difference in, in I think the getting a full spectrum probiotic is more effective than just the fermented foods all right what so else we got before we move on people are having a whole lot of trouble with mm. reception on your end do you mm -hmm. want to try to connect to AccuHerbal internet no I no? can I think my phone's probably better than the other okay. stuff so okay um so mine gonna, seems okay. I'm on just AccuHerbals if you want to try yeah. 5G. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just like move my computer and hope that does something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll try again. I'll watch and see. Um, this next question is wondering if a person would need to adjust or adopt certain diet restrictions when advised oh, yeah. on herbal therapeutics. Um, different tastes like bitters and sours can affect absorption, um, but if there's a particular diet that could help or hurt herbs that are given. Yeah, th this was a great question. Uh, yes, it was one of the first ones that came in. Yes. So longer than that on this. So uh, there was there's actually a couple of questions in that one. So part of it was just about diet in general is, you know, I think it was kind of implying is there a, what's the best diet or the right diet? And how does diet um, and specific foods play into um, our herbal medicine and how we utilize that? Uh, so I'm going to start with diet. We'll, no amount of herbs or drugs can overcome a poor diet. And the question...
balances, uh, your constitution, kind of like what was your health that you were born with, plus any current medical situations uh, or medications you may be dealing with. Those kinds of things are going to dictate um, what foods we may recommend or a just general uh, plan that we may look at. So uh, most of the research generally agrees with something loosely resembling the Mediterranean diet, um, which is a diet that's high in vegetables, whole grains, um, oddly a minimum amount of fruits. Uh, I find most of our fruits these days are way too sugary for anybody here for the American diet. That's why we like them so much. And generally uh, small amounts of uh, red meats, with a plethora of different proteins, i.e. fish, especially the oily going to go back to what we teach in class a lot of times um, that why we're still having a hard time with the connection yeah. all right I'm gonna try moving my phone closer and see if that helps huh. all right uh, uh. let's see if that makes a difference for us um, so what we usually talk about is eating the rainbow um, and that in that we eat as many different colored vegetables that ideally are seasonal when available within our means, uh, financial means. Uh Say the same thing because the other argument always is proteins. I would say eat all the proteins. Um, there is so many different options out there for protein. Um, it, it's funny. I think my healthiest uh, client that I have is someone who identifies as vegan, who has a, a really good grass-fed, uh, free-ranging steak about once every month or two. Um, because we don't need to eat an entire cow every day. And so looking at those proteins, uh, whether they're fish or chicken, um, eating a variety of different fish, but then there's lots of uh, vegetarian or vegan-based proteins that should be a part of our regular diet. We, um, I would say, as a whole, the American culture, um, we eat way too much red meat. Uh, and, and I put myself amongst those. But there's often times where we are challenged financially about what's available to us. You may or may not be able to grow vegetables if you're in a, you know, an apartment or a condo. Um, you know, finances, we may end up with some challenges with that. And one of the things I always like to remind people of, that even people who are on government assistance with, um, it used to be called food stamps, now it's EBT. Um, that most of the farmers markets uh, and most of the um, community supported farms will actually double the value of any of those government subsidized uh, food things. And so you can, you know, it's like, well, it's cheaper to buy just rice and flour and, and white bread. There's actually a major effort to no longer make that true. And so, of course, those things have to be available in your community, which is sometimes a challenge. But the question was really interesting about flavor. And this is uh, an important component. And I, I'm gonna switch to Chinese medicine and promise I'll make it understandable for those of you who don't know it. Um, Chinese medicine, we put a flavor with every organ. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily, when I say sweet is associated with the digestion, um, it doesn't necessarily mean sugar, it literally just means the flavor sweet. And 
our body, there's a couple of different ways that we can interpret these flavors. If we want to affect a particular organ, we eat that organ's uh, flavor. Um, if we crave a particular flavor, that might be our body speaking to us that uh, we have some sort of a dysfunction with that. Um, and if you really go down the rabbit hole with Chinese medicine, we can actually increase uh, and eat an excessive amount of a particular flavor in order to affect an associated organ um, when we look at the five element wheel with that concept. And so uh, generally with the digestion and uh, what in Chinese medicine we refer to as the spleen, uh, we look at the flavor sweet. With the lung, uh, we, we kind of almost have two flavors that we associate with that. With the lung, we say to nourish it, we use bland flavors. Um, rice is kind of an interesting mix of bland and sweet. Um, mushrooms are pretty much straight bland. Um, but we also put pungent or acrid associated with the lung. And that's when there's something excessive there. And particularly, we look at those flavors when we have an active cold or flu, um, when we need diaphoresis, which is fan fancy talk for breaking a sweat. Um, so um, with the kidneys, we associate the flavor salty. Uh, and then with the liver, and there's some, I won't say confusion, there's some debate about the liver in particular. The Chinese talk about the liver for having the, the flavor sour and in Western herbal medicine, specifically to affect the liver, we tend to use the bitter. And they both work for, I would say, engaging the bitter, but they do it in different ways. When we want things to, we want to nourish the liver, we tend to use sour. When we want to guide to that area, we use sour. But when we want to stimulate or activate or reduce the liver, we tend to use um, uh, bitter for that. And that's within the Western construct. And, and I, I tend to, um, livers tend to be hot, uh, tend to be challenged by food or are sluggish in their nature, like we need to really wake it up a little bit. Um, I actually prefer bitter flavor for that. Um, and with the heart, the Chinese say bitter, and it's funny, there's different arguments about other ways to affect the liver. And usually we, we like the bitter for the heart as well. I'll now, I, sorry, I'm gonna to switch to a different idea. So those are the flavors and how we address a specific organ. Now add to that, when we're talking food in particular, the overuse of a particular food, like, you know, who doesn't want more yummy sweet stuff? If we have too much yummy sweet stuff, and that could be anything from an over accumulate, uh, an over consumption of something like fruit, or it could be something like too much, you know, apple pie or ice cream and things like that. that are all sweet in their nature. We tend to cause that imbalance. Um, but we also need to look at if we're on specific medications or uh, specifically looking at um, those narrow therapeutic margin medications. And by that, I, I basically mean if we take too much, something bad happens, and we don't take enough, something really bad happens. Um, and chemotherapy, seizure medications, um, blood thinners, those are some of the things that we, we generally talk about a lot. And whether we're talking about food or herbs, the overconsumption of bitter or sour, uh, herbs for sure, foods to a lesser amount, those can affect the way that drugs are processed through the body. Sour foods and especially sour herbs will keep medications in the body longer and slow its ability to be processed out of the body. And bitter herbs tend to speed up the process of things. And so it will process a drug out of the body faster than is anticipated. Um, 
and, and I hate to tell you, there, I, I, I have a, a scary client story. Um, it was a client who was diagnosed with cancer um, and was pursuing the Western medical treatment, um, in particular chemotherapy. And she came in after she'd already finished all of her therapies. She came in to see me to see if I had anything added to her protocol. And um, she carried a number of products. She was, a, I think it was a multi-level marketing, but I won't swear to that, um, of a number of different greens and supplements and things like that. And, you know, she was really excited to tell me that even though the doctor told her not to do any of those, she did them anyway because she knew how good they were. And they were a lot of, she was doing a lot of juicing and a lot of bitter vegetables. Um, the green strings had lots of bitter vegetables in there and she did it all throughout her chemotherapy and she was so proud to tell me how she got no side effects, no nausea, no fatigue, um, and all of her blood values were great through her entire chemotherapy. No neuropathy or hair never fell out. And I, I was actually sad to hear this because she probably pushed all of that chemotherapy out of her body. Um, unfortunately, about a year after that, her tumor marker started to go back up. And um, I, I strongly encouraged her not to do that. When we're looking at something like chemotherapy, dealing with cancer, I hate to say it, it's poison and it does harm to the body. It, it does some damage to the host, that's us, while it destroys the cancer. And sometimes it does a good job, sometimes it doesn't. And there's things we can do to support the body. Um, just to maintain the blood values. But generally, we don't want to detoxify the body. We don't want to purge. We don't want to cleanse the body while we're actively going through chemotherapy. Um, the best thing we can do is just eat a well-rounded, normal diet. Um, I'll oftentimes recommend things like bone broth to maintain blood values, and mushrooms are generally considered safe. Um, I think I kind of answered that question um, I, literally, I could talk about food for days. Um, and, and I'll just as generic, I'll say um, I've been there, uh, vegan, vegetarian diet um, can be very healthy. Um, the problem is, is so often it ends up being convenience foods. So I always say to be a healthy vegan, somebody's got to be processing those foods. Um, and making sure that, again, we're focusing on all the different colors, the variety of, in this case, vegan proteins. But regardless of how perfect you're being with it all, make sure you supplement with a B complex and pay attention to healthy fats. And so very possible to do a great job and be super, super healthy, but making sure that you're putting an emphasis on fats and supplementing with a, I always say B complex rather than a B12, but it is about the B12. Um, I don't know. Throw another one at me. All right. Someone online has experienced herbs kicking their butt initially, but when sticking with the formula long term, their body gets better. Is yeah. that typical? Sometimes. Um, so that's really funny. Um, so there is what's called a Herxheimer response, but all the cool kids just call it a Herx response. Um, as Herxheimer is way too hard to say. Um, and so that, that's a thing. <laughs> and the trick is to differentiate between, oh, I totally screwed up and gave you the wrong herbs or the wrong formula versus a die off of um, yeast, bacteria, fungus, viruses, things like that. So if we go after an excess of stuff too aggressively, the body doesn't process out literally the waste of all of that. Um, well enough, and that may be a question of our waste disposal system, um, you can get some flu-like symptoms, nausea, vomiting, fatigues, uh, low-grade fever, swollen lymph nodes. That's not unheard of. Um, I tend to prefer not to do that to people, like give it an extra two or three weeks and we can do it without that. So anytime you get nausea, diarrhea, chills and fever, you really have, I would say, contact your herbalist um, and ensure that they didn't do, you know, like I hate to say it, it is called the practice, just like with mes Western medicine. Sometimes we don't do the, uh, we miss something or we get the imbalances wrong. 
So we always need to make sure that it's like, okay, let's see if it's the herbs if, if we did something wrong. Um, usually cutting back on your dosing and, and or frequency a little bit to be a little bit more gentle about it and ensuring that you're getting adequate water uh, so that your lymphatic system and, and all of your other disposal systems are working well. One of the things we talk about the most, and like everybody talks about the liver, um, and you know, we, we do live in a toxic society and our liver is part of that two-step uh, process of breaking down substances. Those may be toxins or they might be lunch. Uh, which may be the same thing. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it is part of that process of breaking things down. And when we stimulate the, um, the liver in order to make it function a little bit better, to cool it off, if we're not eliminating, think poop here. If you are not having a uh, healthy bowel movement every day, and you're going after things like liver excess toxin kind of idea, um, you're going to feel like you got hit by a truck. So it's vital that if we're doing something that's cleansing, reducing, getting rid of whatever languaging you've, you're comfortable with, um, the bowel have to be functioning uh, effectively. Um, if not, we'll get that Herx response. So you might be getting that stuff out of a particular area of the body, but you're not effectively eliminating those toxins out of the body. Um, so yes, it happens. It shouldn't happen all the time. Um, there may be uh, a larger issue if that happens frequent, frequently. One of my soap boxes that I tend to jump up and down on a lot is about uh, healthy stomach acid. Um, and so we're supposed to have hydrochloric acid and I won't say the beginning of our digestive system, but in the generally front end of that. Uh, if you don't have healthy stomach acid, a lot of yeast bacteria and fungus uh, and other stuff, passes through the stomach, which is kind of the sterilizer among its many roles. Um, and we can get an overgrowth of the wrong stuff right at the start of the small intestine. Uh, what's sometimes referred to as uh, SIBO, small intestinal bowel overgrowth or bacterial overgrowth, depending on how you look at it. And what you'll find is that person has a lot of phlegm, a lot of blo bloating, gas, belching, uh, abdominal pain, distension, uh, sometimes uh, bowel issues in general. So a lot of times when you're taking a uh, herb that's either drying or uh, cold in its nature or that is got things like berberine in there, some killy stuff, that it will pass through, it will kill that stuff off, and then the body kind of adjusts to it, but you're not necessarily fixing the problem. So we have to fix that underlying deficiency. Um, uh, we'll have to do a digestion uh, class. We, you know, I, I used to do a lot of uh, Friday free classes that were about stuff. And so that is one of my favorite soapboxes. I'll have to jump up and down Important. and yeah, rant on that one. And, and it's funny, we get a lot of people who come into both regular day clinic and, and student clinic, of course, that we're sitting there, they come in expecting herbs or they want acupuncture and we go over their their issues and we kind of, we look at their tongue, we check their pulse and we go, you know, it's kind of a waste. All of your supplements are a waste. Any herbs I give you are a waste. Here's some hydrochloric acid. You can actually get that as a uh, capsule. And until you take that for two weeks, I don't want to take your money. And so they're, they're always a little baffled and slightly upset sometimes when we don't give them what they anticipated us doing. And we're like, they come back in two or three weeks and it's a whole new world, which is always exciting that they're like, well, I thought you were a quack, but um, not to say that every digestive issue is a low stomach acid. I would say half the time or more it is a low stomach acid uh, issue where we have to go after HCL. So I would say to the original question, sorry, I am rambling, um, to the original question, um, sometimes that's correct, sometimes it's a mistake, sometimes you're not pooping crop properly, 
Um, or sometimes there, if it's happened more than once, this is happening every time you change formulas, that there's a, a primary root cause that hasn't been found out or not being addressed properly yet. I think I got it. <laughs> what else we got? All right. We have a female with a spinal cord injury at C1, mm. C2. Um, yes. She's been injured for 10 years. She's been taking herbs for five years now. St. John's wort, and it sounds like she's doing it as a tea. St. John's wort, fleece flower root, astragalus, cheswan, peppercorn, ginseng, green tea, perilla. Um, and she's recently added milk thistle to her formula. Her bowels are usually normal in the morning using a small suppository, but over the past few days, um, she's not able to have a bowel movement. She's having cramping, but she can't actually go. Um, she's wondering if the change might be due to milk thistle. And as a side, she can walk, but has trouble with balance. Okay, like I, I of course have a thousand questions <laughs> and, and fascinating um in the the formula there's a number i'm not sure where that formula came from so because it's super interesting a korean oh that's right there was yes. a korean a acupuncturist korean, yes acupuncturist five years ago so <laughs> normally and, and you know sorry I'm, I'm i'm talking to you specifically and i saw you were here so awesome um actually i think you've been here almost every time um, but I also want to just say a, a few things that are for everybody that may not be clear. C, C12, yes, um, is your neck. And so uh, super scary because if that had been a complete sever, uh, then honestly, I don't know that that's survivable. So however you got that, it probably you know doesn't always feel this way, but holy crap, you were really freaking lucky. Um, so, you know, we look at cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. So that's C, number, T, a number, L, a number, and then uh, S, a number. And that's when you're talking to a chiropractor or a physical therapist or a doctor, when they say, oh, your T9 is out of whack or your L2 is, uh, you know, pinching on a nerve that's what they're referring to is the various vertebrae in your spine and um, there there are a number of different things that I may or may not uh, utilize in a case uh, where there is a nerve or spinal injury if there's prescription medications then I would never use st. John's wort internally but if there aren't any uh, specific, uh, if there aren't any uh, prescription medications, that would be a wonderful addition. Um, I would say, I'm assuming uh, part of the, the bowel issue is the actual nerves not functioning quite the way, you know, that the signaling is getting out of whack um, from the injury. Um, so if you can't do them internally, I would say St. John's wort added in topically as a St. John's wort oil rubbed on uh, the spine as well as on the abdomen itself on a daily basis would probably help. Um, I'm gonna talk about that formula. I'm gonna ask you those herbs again because I, I only remember half of them. But the milk thistle itself, it's such an interesting herb. So milk thistle is a wonderful herb. It's protective for the liver. Um, generally, I consider it a very safe herb. Even the uh, Mayo Clinic talks about the safety and effectiveness of the uh, milk thistle as being uh, HEPA protective or helpful in, uh, for liver health. Um, and especially if you're on uh, serious medications or for people who are exposed to chemicals, drink a little bit too much, we've, there's some really good research out there to show that milk thistle has real benefit that said, I would say all the thistles have that benefit. Um, artichoke, if you didn't know it, is a thistle. And although it may not be as effective as um, milk thistle is, it is effective for being HEPA protective and beneficial. Um, so even if you're going to the, um, the olive bar to get all of the yummy olives and pickled vegetables. They usually have uh, the uh, artichoke in oil. And so that might be a, a easier way to approach that. 
um, and get some of those thistle benefits, the it's always an interesting thing. Normally, I think of seeds as being moistening. And so I would think that most seeds added in where um, bowel motility or bowel movements or a challenge, seeds are generally a very gentle way to moisten. That said, there aren't a, every milk thistle seed I've ever worked with, it tends not to have um, a lot of oils in it. And so there's debate as to whether it has a drying nature to it or a moistening agent to it. So it's not bad in and of itself, but it may have tipped the scales of energetics a little bit into a way that's not being helpful. And for, for all of you who have you know, jumped on here a little bit, um, we do harp on energetics quite a lot. And so energetics is kind of the nature of the human or the animal, because we got an animal question or two coming up. Um, <clears throat> but when we look at that, we, we all, you know, 98.6, unless you have a fever or something. But if we we're all sitting in the office and the, 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 the temperature on the AC or the heat was set at a particular thing, half the people would be freezing, half would be uh, sweating and, you know, uh, sitting there with fans and all this other silliness. And yet, if we took a thermometer, they would all be the same temperature. And so that's the idea of energetics. The, the same idea, ginger isn't spicy necessarily, but it warms the body, it warms the digestion. Watermelon, my favorite example, is very cooling to the body and refreshing. Um, and you don't have to add a physical temperature. It's just the way they feel in the body, how they interact with the body. So in the same sense, we look at the concepts of both the nature of the human and the nature of food and the nature of herbs all have the same idea as energetic. So they are hot or cold, they're wet or dry, they're nourishing or reducing, and they're tense or lax. We usually refer to the organism of that. So an herb that helps with relaxation or um, tension or spasm would be a relaxing um, and something that stuff's leaking out, drippy, wet, um, lax tissues. We look at things that tighten or tone those tissues together. Um, so in the case of milk thistle, it, it doesn't clearly fit in there as well as we would like because part of it, it, it sits in two worlds, if you will. Milk thistle seed, depending on its freshness um, and what it's combined with, it may show to be a little moistening or a little drying. Primarily, I think it would probably nudge it towards the dry nature. Because it is um, protective to the litter, liver, there's a nourishing aspect to it, but it, it seems to actually clear heat out of the liver as well as um, reduce the toxicity. So it has a reducing and a nourishing action to it. So it is one of the, I would say, really safe generally, and yet one of those herbs that is challenging. Um, in this case, because the, the nature of having a damaged spine, uh, spinal cord, where there is uh, a lack of, there's some mobility, obviously you said it was just difficult, and sorry, I totally stalked you. I could see in the pictures that there was some uh, loss of, of action to the hands. So there's a little bit of clawing of the fingers. We'll see that a lot of times where there is a permanent or semi-permanent um, spinal cord injury where because it's not getting the nerve signaling, things tend to curl up. The feet can curl up. Hands can curl up, even arms and everything else. Um, and so, sorry, I, I'm super nosy. And I was like, wow, this is a really interesting question. So that, that tends to be a complex combination where it also doesn't simply fit into a single category of hot, cold, wet, dry, deficient, excess. It's usually a combination of all of them. But in general, the nature of um, the contracted aspect of the tendons in particular, in this case, um, there isn't tone to the bowel, so it didn't sound like it was constipation so much as a lack of 
uh, motility, the peristalsis, the nerve signaling from that, that tells it to move along and push out poop. Um, so what the heck would we do with any of this? So, oh, tell me, the, there was Szechuan pepper, there was... Fleece flower root. Okay, so fleece flower root, let me talk about that. If I remember correctly, that's also known as he show wu or Mr. He's Black Hair. Uh, some people, uh, especially if you lived out in Hawaii in the 70s, uh, knew it as faux tea. Um, so not only is this considered this very nourishing, uh, generally considered safe, uh, especially when it's in a powder or decoction, I don't like it in alcohol. Um, it can restore black, and like if you have gray hair, it literally can turn your hair black, not if you were blonde before. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, and I've got way too many examples of that uh, with folks who were 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, that it starts to literally bring in black roots. It's, it's also very moist in its nature. And so um, I remember, as you said, some of those herbs, some of them were moistening and some of them were kind of drying. So I was like, ooh, but that in there is such a good way to um, strengthen the essence of the Jing in Chinese medicine, uh, provide nourishment and the moisture that we need for a healthy bowel movement. So, Astragalus. Astragalus. So that's uh, Huang Qi for the Chinese folks. Astragalus is great for the immune system, has an upward action, would guide into the upper body, um, and just overall good for you herb. And depending on who you ask, I argue with a few people about this, in particular David Winston. Um, oh, that's super interesting. Sorry, I just saw the comment on there. Um, the, uh, some people say that astragalus mm -hmm. is slightly moistening. I find it's actually dry in its nature. So we would have to be careful not to have too much of the astragalus in there. Uh, although there's so many reasons why that's just an interesting and brilliant one to have in that formula. What else? Uh, ginseng. They didn't mm -hmm. say which kind, but ginseng. So ginseng, probably Korean since he was a Korean. That would make sense. <laughs> so point. the uh, renchen, uh, the, the ginseng, it, it's an interesting one because it's nourishing, it's warming, which counteracts the coolness of the uh, hisha wu, the fleece flower root, um, but it's moist in its nature. And so that one is about... That this formula that this guy produced was very much about the essence, and and we talk about the Jing or the essence um, more as the um, embryo is developing, as as uh, as a, after a child's born, that we say the Jing or the essence fills the spinal cord and then fills the brain, uh, which we call the sea of marrow, and so with a spinal cord injury using those things that are all this root nourishing uh, essence of who you are to bring those up um, makes total sense and, and a really unique uh, approach and, and positive one. Um, what else is in there after the ginseng? This gym one scene? I don't recognize. Hutania? Oh, Hutonia. Hutonia. Um, oh, okay. That is Yuxing Sao. Uh, that's, uh, we actually grow that here. Um, so it's fishy smelling herb as its translation. I've also, it's sold sometimes as fish mint. Um, cooling, moistening, and, and it's funny, the uh, Yuxing Sao is got a whole bunch of, and actually type the Latin name in there so folks know what the heck it is, because I'm not going to pretend to spell it. <laughs> Um, really interesting herb where there's new research coming out, uh, both from a Chinese energetic standpoint as well as Western medicine is starting to explore that one a little bit. I forget the Latin, the Latin name already. Uh, Hutonia. Okay. Yeah. Is that pronounced? Is that, is that I always think Hutentot. Yeah. Okay. H O U T, and you're on your own after that. Okay. I'm going to it. <laughs> oh, it's, so, I, I thought I don't it was think, I'm not sure it's spelled right there. Oh, it might be off. It's it, not spelled you, as It, it might be on the label Yuxing Sal there. Um, it's very easy to grow. It is, uh, I believe it is uh, Laminaceae. I believe it's related to the mints. Um, there is a uh, Y-U. <laughs> yeah, maybe I don't have it up on the shelf. It's around somewhere. Um, I can't find it. But now so, I'll spell it how it's spelled there. I might suggest, and, and this one, you know, I don't know your case, but um, just because of the curling, and that's really interesting that there's a, yeah. 
correlation between the bowel movements improving and the uh, contraction of the of the extremities that those are connected that's super fascinating um, I assume you're using the milk thistle just to be protective of the liver I might suggest that if you're looking specifically for uh, liver protection burdock is a gentler way to go um, and will be a little bit more cooling and nourishing nice um, and you might also look at Solomon seal and I, I, I think I saw in my stalking of you uh, <laughs> I know I feel a little creepy in admitting it too uh, <laughs> uh, it. yeah right <laughs> Um, that you're living out on the West Coast. And so I don't know if there's Solomon seal growing out there, but that is an herb that um, is easily accessible from Western herbal sources, uh, the Solomon seal. Uh, and it's also the Chinese herb Huang Jing, H U A N G J I N G. Um, I actually prefer the Chinese one. I was actually what I was snacking on uh, before we started. <laughs> it's super yummy. They steam it uh, and it creates a sweetness to it. But that is specific in Western herbal medicine uh, for contracted tendons um, and might help with some of the bowel motility issues. Um, so my, sh my, my short answer to all of that is fascinating and amazing and that whoever that uh, Korean doctor was it rock and great approach the milk thistle seed may be the cause of it um, and if you are still in California you might uh, be able to find a, a good acupuncture uh, physician out there and it's funny as I'm saying this I forget where in California, but I, I want to say near LA, LA is, um, oh, there is a Korean-based acupuncture school there, and um, I forget whether it's Five Branches or Samara. One of those two is the Korean acupuncture school out there that you would be able to get a similar kind of treatment because obviously you had some really good success and you know if finances are a challenge at all uh, it's um, you would be able to get uh, a reduced rate in a student clinic or some of the supervisors <laughs> um, I think I answered that question. I think so. I think <laughs> that was a really interesting one. Why? I, the energetics that you're talking about, the cold and hot. I look at us and you're wearing short sleeve and shorts. And, and you're right. Long pants and a long sleeve shirt. And, and she's sweater. freezing. Yeah, and I'm like, I could use a blanket. So <laughs> it's just funny. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure our body temperatures are the same. Yeah, probably. Uh, just, yeah. It is the it is definitely the nature it's of energetics, isn't it? Yeah, we got to remember that next time you're in class. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Okay, we've got an animal question. Yay! Uh, advice for hyperkeratosis in dogs. Recommended treatment is to trim the excess. But is there a way to slow the excess production of keratin? So, um. So yeah, hyperkeratosis in dogs. So um, if you'd had Trisha's cool um, A and P class, you could break those words down and figure out what the heck that is. Word surgery. <laughs> Word surgery, yeah, I like that language. <laughs> um, so um, hyper means excess. Uh, keratosis, I'll, I'll go with the keratin is the root of that. And keratin is kind of the hard protein that is, is in our skin. Huh? Yeah, the waterproofing <laughs> of our skin. Yeah, I was trying to, what's the good way to describe yeah. that? But that's perfect. Um, and, and so basically all that is, is it's an overgrowth of skin in, uh, I, as far as I know, it's primarily in dogs. I'm sure it affects other animals too. Oddly enough, it tends to affect their paws and their nose. And I don't know this to be true, but I'm going to do a wild ass guess of Bob and say it's primarily their forepaws rather than their um, back paws. The reason being um, the nose has an association in Chinese medicine to the lungs. 
and the lung channel is in the arms on two legged and in the case of uh, puppy dogs is on their forepaws mm -hmm. and the excessiveness of that growth is, oh it's funny if I remember right it's got a, a nickname hairy paws that we <laughs> it looks sometimes like that. an excess growth of hair or chunky hair on their paws I don't know I'm just being a weirdo um, the uh, so the the um, general treatment of that is literally just to cut off the excess skin growth, keratin growth. Um, it's something a person can do themselves, but it's a, it's hard because if you cut too aggressively, it can be painful. Um, in the case of my puppy, my dog doesn't have that, but um, just trimming his nails needs uh, me and the dog need sedation, uh, <laughs> and so. The nature of when you look at it, when you think about what it looks like, it has a association with a dried phlegm condition. And I'm going to give you the, the um, oh, ancient Chinese saying, sorry, there's a better way to say that. But we have a number of uh, truths or sayings in Chinese medicine. And we say the spleen or the digestion. So the digestion is the producer of phlegm and the lung is the container. Um, so we oftentimes will see an association. It can be environmental, but generally we look at the nature of the digestion. And this is true for puppies as well as two-leggeds. Uh, the nature of the digestion and the food that we eat and the, our ability to digest um, will produce the phlegm but we'll frequently see it associated in the uh, lung. So if, if you've ever uh, had a friend, um, of course, none of us here would ever do that, had something like a pizza or a beer or something like that, something that's very phlegm producing in the body, a glass of milk, um, we eat or drink these things and, <coughs> you know, that's the phlegm. And so it tends to be then manifesting in the lungs. Uh, I am the poster child of that. Um, my, all the practitioners and staff here can immediately know um, whether I was eating healthy the day before or not, depending on the drippiness of my nose or the coughiness of my lungs and you know in this day and age boy you don't want to be coughing for any reason everybody is like duck and cover um, so I would start by looking at the health of the digestion system for a dog um, and then consider um, herbs that are helpful for the digestion so um, ensuring there aren't too many grains in the food uh, is oftentimes a problem with dog food. The quality of the proteins that are in there and ensuring there's healthy fats, not a bunch of weird additives. Um, sometimes the addition of glandulars into the food can be helpful and a lot of dog foods have that. Um, you, you find like cats had uh, a need to eat specific glands. Uh, dogs don't have as common a, a, like they must have this gland in there, um, but it can be helpful. Um, and then looking at the strength of the lung. Because of the hardness of the phlegm, we would probably add, and again, I'm saying this probably because without the, the puppy dog in front of me, it's really hard to comment in specific recommendations. But something like burdock would be a great addition gently moistening uh, and helps with the digestive system, reduces inflammation. Um, it helps to reduce the overstimulation of mast cells. Uh, might look at something like marshmallow. Again, a cooling, moistening, and specific for the lungs. Um, yeah, those are my short answers to that. Uh, we might look at something like um, uh, some of the mushrooms can be helpful for that. We might look at potentially some diuretics. Um, you could also look specifically at uh, Smilax Medica. Um, I would say Smilax any of the herbs. So Smilax is S-M-I-L-A-X. Yeah, there we go. I, I can say them, but I can't spell them. <laughs> 
Uh, and this is Smilax Medica, which is, and this gets really confusing, is sometimes referred to as sarsaparilla. Usually in the Carib Caribbean, Jamaica specifically, it's referred to as that. Uh, in Chinese medicine, we have Tu Fu Ling. Uh, that is a type of uh, Smilax. It's the Greenbrier Smilax. But as a general rule, all the Smilax have a similar role in uh, reducing uh, skin inflammation and can have almost a steroidal-like positive effect uh, for skin issues. Um, yeah, those are my biggies. Okay. You know, oh, you know what? There is one other thing with the hyperkeratinosis. Um, it is important to get a vet to properly diagnose this. There are a number of issues that can mimic those symptoms. Weird stuff like leishmaniasis and a couple of other things that are not popping into my head. Some organ internal medicine things. Oh, and I said glandulars, yeah. Glandulars can be helpful as well. Um, you know, it's important. When we think of like, I'm gonna buy the best food for my dog, or I'm gonna make sure my dog eats the same, you know, sirloin steak that I do and things like that. That's awesome. But in nature, dogs, cats uh, are uh, carnivorous and they would be chasing down something, catching it and eating all of that animal to include the glandulars. And so a lot of the, the trace nutrients and uh, and so forth that animals get are from eating um, this the junk out of them what we would normally throw away so there's some dog foods will have that added some not uh, and we can actually buy a variety of um, you know what used to be called the sweet meats or the sweet breads uh, or the glandulars. <laughs> Sorry, Trisha is over here looking horrified yeah. because she does not eat meat. <laughs> um, oh, and a question just popped up. Um, uh, do I suggest aloe? No, I generally, well, I shouldn't say that. Aloe is phenomenal. I prefer it topically. Um, I find that aloe is, uh, has the potential to block a number of medications and is uh, too cold in its nature. Um, it's actually considered a Chinese herb whose name is not in my brain. Uh, totally can't think of it. Um, and we consider it for clearing heat. So we might use it for a high fever, um, a burning sensation, stomach fire, things like that. I think it's wonderful for the skin, uh, both for Things like sunburn, it's one of our go-tos. Uh, but the nature of it is to create a protective coating over the body. And if we per create this protective coating over the intestines, we're literally reducing the ability of the body to um, absorb some of its nutrients. And there's some research out there that shows it does um, block certain nutrients uh, being involved. Uh, it's funny, you know, Certainly aloe, we can grow it here. Everybody's got a, an aloe plant sitting in the crappy sandy soil that we have here. But one that's native to Florida is uh, some of the cactus. And so we use cactus in a similar way. Um, and I would say the cactus, uh, good for sunburn, cooling, moistening, but more nutritious than aloe. Uh, and so uh, the the paddle, the, um, oh, and I totally, I've, forgot the common name for it as well. Um, but the the cactus paddles can be grilled um, or added into soups and stews and is a food that is wonderful and uh, more has more nutrients uh, and doesn't seem to block the absorption the way that aloe does. I'm gonna ask a strange question. Yeah. How do you deal with the prickly? Ah, uh, yes. So, no, that's a great question. Yeah. So you can get um, spineless uh, cactus paddles. It's driving me nuts that I can't think of the name of it. Um, okay, somebody, somebody knows what that spineless is. Spineless cactus paddles. Um, but even some of the spineless ones, I don't trust them. So classically, when I've eaten them, um, I throw them in the fire or burn, and you burn them off. Okay. You know, they are, they're visible little tufts of tiny spikes that you can cut off with a knife. 
But throwing it in the fire, the wonderful grilled, or in this case, charred. <laughs> um, and that's just a quick, easy way that doesn't require a lot of processing uh, for that. Okay. They're calling it a spineless prickly pear. Yeah, the prickly pear is one of them. What's the common okay. name for it? Elciana? No, that's a fancy name. A um, and I am going to take a minute to do a station identification. So I appreciate you all hanging out here. It looks like we have some people coming in and out. Um, so I'm Bob Lindy from the Tradition School of Herbal Studies and Acupuncture and Herbal Therapy. See if you happen to be in the Bay Area. You can find out more at traditionsherbschool.com or acuherbals1c.com uh, and find out about all the cool class. No polys, thank you. Ha! I can't believe I can't think of no polys. Wow. Uh, <laughs> that's the right word. Um, um, and yes, actually, they're used for uh, poisonous bites. They're reducing hot and toxins, and aloe is great for that as well. Um, and you can find the recording of this. We'll put it on YouTube by tomorrow evening this time. Uh, if you're in the area, actually, even if you're not in the area, we're teaching first aid this weekend, uh, and there's still time to sign up. You can do that online or in person. Always more fun in person, but that's okay. Uh, and we've got lots of other cool classes that are standalone classes like the first aid. If you're in the Tampa Bay area and didn't know it, we've got the open streets where they're shutting down most of Central Avenue, including right in front of our store here. Um, so we're going to have a booth out there and we have some bloody punch, I think <laughs> I called it, um, that'll be a lot of fun. So please, if you have an opportunity, stop by, say hi, say you heard it on here. And uh, we're just giving out free samples for all the uh, trick-or-treaters slash uh, people walking around. And I just watched a werewolf walk by. Oh, <laughs> Everybody's it's doing their, their holiday parties, obviously, <laughs> this evening. Oh, I can't believe I'm missing out on it. Uh, all right. What's that? So, you know, actually, I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. It's one of the really neat things um, when we understand energetics, uh, you know, what if you don't have aloe? What can we use? All we have to do is know the energetics of those plants around us. Um, I, I poisoned myself by accident and I'll spare you all the long story. There are many poisoning of Bob stories. Uh, and uh, I ended up uh, the, the uh, calcium oxalates that were in here uh, were in this, it was the Jack in the Pulpit, uh, was this hot, burning, searing pain in my mouth uh, when somebody gave me this plant and said, here, try this, it's spicy. Um, and I didn't have any of the herbs that I might have classically used for it. So literally, I ran to find a plant that I knew was cold in nature. Uh, and in this case, I found the Smilax and I just chewed it up and it's, uh, cooling and anti-inflammatory, steroidal like its nature. And so I could do that. Um, and the cactus pads I can use because of its cold nature. We can literally put it on our school, skin and feel how cooling and refreshing it is. Um, we can use it in the same way as the aloe. Um, but there are many plants. Actually, the one we talked about, uh, the Yuxing Sao, the fishy smelling herb, very cooling as well and can be used topically for uh, poisonous bites. So um, the nature of poison uh, is frequently very hot. Some, some of them are cold, some of them are hot. Um, but most of your bites and stings, think of any time you've been bit by a mosquito or a fly, it's like hot and it gets red and swollen. Then we need to put cold and uh, reducing herbs on there. And so great if you have all like the million different herbs that we all need because of course I do because I'm fanatical um, but the the nature of the herb we can match with the nature of that acute injury and get almost as good if not better sometimes results from things um, well there's an interesting question yeah. do we offer classes um, so that people can learn at their own pace and you know and it's a real challenge sometimes because um, no matter whether it, any of us teach it, actually, me, Renee, Trisha, like we just vomit information at everyone. And there's no way anybody could in, in, literally ingest that much information in a single sitting. Um, 
And I know a, a number of you have been our students in the past who are just sitting on this. Um, so all of it, yay, thank you, COVID. All of our, our uh, classes are recorded now. And for students who have registered, we always um, send you that recording so that you can uh, continue to learn from it. And I want to say at least in 80% of our classes, we give you additional resources um, where you can continue to read or learn. We give you handouts um, if there's textbooks. Um, because there's no way we can give people enough information, you know, like literally we would hold everyone hostage for 12 hours a day, seven days a week and vomit at you for 10 years to try to teach you everything that we like to, uh, or like that we know. Um, but that's not reasonable. So a lot of times we give people a framework of understanding, the energetics in particular, um, and then allow you to expand or explore uh, or pick up some of that extra knowledge as we talk about these classes and are refining it through the things like these classes. Um, and of course, and, and I'm sure you've already seen them, uh, we try to, and you know, we've been slacking a little bit. Uh, now that it's cooled off, we'll probably do some more videos. So the YouTube channel for Tradition School of Herbal Studies is a great resource to um, explore some of the, the concepts that we talk about. We try to do uh, those on a fairly regular basis, and I've now got a backlog of classes I need to teach. So hopefully that that's allows people to process some of the information, um, especially when we're doing like a weekend intensive, uh, going back and listening and, and watching the video from that uh, a couple more times um, so you can take notes and so forth uh, is always a good way um, to try to get as glean as much of that information and put it into your brain space as possible. Also, they can sit in on a class as a repeat. Oh, yes, thank if, you. If it comes up again. Yeah, anytime somebody's uh, paid for a class, um, we actually encourage our students to sit in either online or if, if we're able to accommodate them uh, in person to sit through that class again. And, and in the same way, it's like, yay, doing the open forum again. It so often just depends on the questions that people ask, what crazy tangents. So I think it's always great to be able to sit through uh, the classes. It, we've, we've had a couple of students who sat through, oh, let's just say a lot. Uh, they, like, we have one student that um, she sat through our Western 101 class probably 10 times. I'm, I'm guessing at that number, but I'm, I'm probably pretty close. And one of the things that we do is uh, we, we show and, and teach a process of how to process astragalus, the Huang Qi. And we do it in a bunch of different preparations and we have the students taste it. It's a process in Chinese medicine called Pao Zhu. And that, that allows them to recognize some of the ways that we can guide it, uh, just like we were talking earlier about flavors because um, we're using vinegar, sour, or we're using salty to guide that medicine into a particular way, um, that she was on a lot of medications when she first started the classes. And then as she slowly got herself off of her medications, the flavor that she preferred um, changed. Uh, and she actually wrote those things down as she sat through each class. She talked about how her does, her affinity for a particular flavor changed constantly. Um, and in the beginning, it didn't match anybody else in the class. And by the end, it lined up with what everybody else kind of liked. So it's really interesting um, when you have that opportunity to kind of sit through and re-experience some of those classes about what would you suggest for hair loss in women? Sure. Um, so <clears throat> hair loss, there, it's important to recognize there are many reasons why people lose their hair. Um, that when it's genetic, uh, I always say like, no, blame your grandmama. Um, <laughs> so there is a genetic trait for male pattern baldness that's usually passed through uh, the women, but women will tend to get thinner hair if they're, if they're, you uh, have that genetic trait. But there are a couple of other things that we tend to see. Um, there can be a failure to process, excuse me, boy, brain fish failed for a second. Failure to process 
dehydrotestosterone, which is kind of the used up testosterone. And women and men both have testosterone. They both have the DHT, which is way easier to say uh, than dehydrotestosterone. Um, and so we see that in particular with folks who also have PCOS. Uh, they frequently end up with thinning hair because they have higher amounts of testosterone frequently. Um, and for women, they're not as good at processing out that used up testosterone. Um, also, stress can affect it. Uh, anemia can affect it. So if you're like red blood cells or platelets or anything like that is really low. Um, the, our hair, our hair follicles are living things that have a blood supply going there and uh, coming and going to it. And it, I hate to say it, probably my favorite way to address uh, thinning hair or hair falling out um, besides looking at the overall health and constitution and balances of the individual, my, my easy answer is make a very strong infusion, tea, with rosemary, um, just regular household rosemary. Um, you can grow, it's such an easy plant to grow. Uh, make that strong infusion of that and uh, spray it on or rinse your hair with it after your shower and leave it in. Uh, rosemary is such a, a fascinating plant. A, it helps with memory. Um, so if you're into Shakespeare, and I was, one of these days I'm going to look up which Shakespeare play it came from. Uh, but uh, there is a line in, I, somebody told me, I think it was Hamlet or Othello, I forget which one. Um, uh, it helps with remembering your past, present, and future. Uh, and the uh, that also it has a unique property of being uh, a rubefacient, which is fancy talk for it brings blood to the surface. So like if you made an oil of rosemary and rubbed it on your cheeks, you would actually get rosy cheeks. Um, so rubbing it into the hair will ensure that those uh, nerve uh, follicles, those nerve, or excuse me, those hair follicles uh, and hair roots are being nourished with blood. Um, the the other p possible reason is if there's a um, fungus uh, and so you can get like a fungal infections in the in the hair follicles because of the aromatic properties of the rosemary that also will help with that sometimes so my short answer is always like start with rosemary throw it in your hair it's very nice if you know if you shower in the morning or put it in the morning because it helps with focus and alertness and memory which we all need that um, boy, I should throw it on my entire body before I come and do this. It's Hamlet, by the way. Hamlet, okay, I was close. Um, uh, after that, it really is about um, working on the imbalance. If it is the dehydrotestosterone, uh, specifically in women, although men can use it as well, uh, saw palmetto. Uh, which is very good at helping process that, and that can be used both topically and internally, uh, to, usually to good success. Um, there's other herbs, and, and just because of uh, you asking it, I'm going to say I wouldn't use this, but internally if it's a DHT, dehydrotestosterone issue, um, uh, stinging nettle root can be used, but in your case it's probably too drying, so don't use that one. Uh, for the rest of us in the world, we can use that for enlarged prostate for men, which is also caused by an accumulation uh, of DHT. Um, ah. All right. All right. You've got a question about external use of some Solanaceae plants and other poison plants and fungi for pain. Uh, she has a liniment from Thomas Easley's oh, yeah. Eclectica Botanical with Datura and Amanita. Amanita. Yeah, it's a uh, my husband used it for his shoulder surgery pain and loved it. Okay. So I generally stare away from talking about really dangerous things on the open <laughs> forum, but um, I feel pretty safe about this one. A, Thomas, and Thomas is a friend, uh, that liniment kicks butt, but I'm going to put a whole slew of cautions with that. <laughs> so it is safe topically with reasonable use. If you bathe in it, like you fill your bathtub with his liniment, that means you just won the lottery because it's expensive, um, and you go and soak yourself in there for a few hours, I don't know what's going to happen. Probably not good things and you'll see pretty colors um, right before you die. Um, 
Um, but that said, for uh, using it either along the spine, like so if you had neuropathy pain in particular, um, putting it both locally and then along the spine, it would be very, very effective. The cautions I put in there, so don't use it on too large of an area um, because there is some absorption. You know, you figure there's a 10% absorption through the skin. Um, so only for specific areas, um, and that doesn't, you know, I'm going to say 10% of the body surface would probably be a safe number to toss out there. Um, and I would say that's maximum. Um, always start with a small amount and make sure that you don't have some kind of weird reaction to it because both of those are considered poisonous and hallucinatory um, and in larger amounts deadly um, and like not even playing with the deadly word. Um, it is, there's a huge debate as to how it's functioning but probably changing the way the sensory nerves um, respond uh, to the spine with the information. Um, my other caution is if you have children or pets that like to lick things off of you, I would be hyper conscious to ensure like if I put on uh, magnesium oil on my dog wants to lick that off. If I put, I can't even think of what, any kind of oil or liniment, I, that dog is going straight there. Uh, and so like if you put it on a shoulder and then you hugged a child, that's now on an infant or child. And so for adults, I would consider it safe um, or adult size. It's never safe to ingest those, uh, both Datura and Amanita are both considered deadly poisons. Um, and just to be weird, uh, Datura is a hallucinogen that people use. Um, there are a number of deaths per year from people who don't do it right, but it's specifically to see death, um, which not always a happy thing to see. And, and so literally, so it's you can walk up to death and understand uh, life and then go back. Um, it, it is, in most traditional medicine, it's only used when all else fails and nothing else would work. Um, and it's always supervised. Uh, and that's for internal ingestion. So I would never, 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 never recommend that. Amanitas um, are fascinating because they are used, again, for hallucinations, can kill you as far as I understand, um, and is the source for Santa Claus. So it's the red and white polka dotted mushroom um, that grows throughout the world pretty much. It's more common northern. I've heard of it growing here in Florida. I haven't found one here in Florida. Um, but uh, it, it's fascinating because it, it was originally known for the word shaman actually is a very specific uh, group of indigenous people that are from Siberia. Uh, we now use it, we, we, we use the term shaman to kind of talk about any spiritual healer person. Um, and that's fine, that's now our, our common language, but back in the day, it literally came from Siberia. And uh, they would actually gather up, if I'm remembering correctly, they would gather up the Amanita mushrooms and they would bury them in the ground, um, probably for in some sort of fermentation uh, process for up to a year. And they would bring them out during winter solstice. Interesting. And so those would harvest and they would drink them in vision and have raucous joy and all that, which uh, if we look at the Saturnarian uh, celebrations, which was also the uh, winter festival, those were usually drunken debauchery, um, and in this case, hallucinatory. And the representation of red and white and Santa in the red and white suit was and the beard and the big burly dude was the Siberian shamans tripping, <laughs> wow. seeing pretty colors, and it was represented by the Amanita mushroom. Wow. Like Didn't know weird. that every time you're <laughs> celebrating old Jolly Saint Nick, <laughs> we wow. were literally because he was a stoner. Uh, That's exciting. <laughs> Um, 
But I will say, uh, if you have access to Thomas's, I don't know whether he sells that to the general public or not. Um, I know I've gotten it from him in conference. Um, I only use that for the most severe pain. Like um, that, that is definitely not gentle medicine, but safe and effective when used correctly. All right, you've got another one, oh, a couple on the <laughs> but um, not sure if you've seen it, but someone recently released a book about all of these plants and their use. Haven't seen myself. So I haven't seen the plants. book okay. personally on working with poisonous mushrooms. Um, you know, in Chinese medicine, we actually use a lot of poisonous plants, um, but they're processed to detoxify them. That said, uh, one of those is monk's hood, um, the uh, aconite, and considered to be a deadly poison. Even with proper processing, a majority of the adverse events of herbs uh, that result in death or organ failure are from aconite that is not properly processed or utilized. Um, there, there's a number of classes, um, there's uh, some Facebook groups, the, and I know there's some books, and I, I, I hate to say it, I've not participated in any of those current ones. I've had um, some training in that, actually at an herb conference, I did a two-day intensive specifically on toxic uh, herbs and how to safely utilize them. Most of them are used for pain, um, not only, but most are. Uh, so I always put huge caution, like why use a uh, poisonous plant when we can do the same thing with a non-poisonous plant and not risk hurting anybody. Um, so the, the reality is, yeah, they're out there. Um, when Googling slash even in classes, if it's not somebody I personally know and trust, um, uh, books even because books are oftentimes done by researchers who may or may not know what the heck they're doing and may or may not have actually worked with the herbs especially in the herbal realm there are a lot of people who are really good researchers and lousy clinicians um, so always find three independent sources if you're going if you're going to research any kind of use of poisonous plants make sure they're not quoting each other um, it's super common that I'll find the same f sentence structure languaging in like 20 sources. So that's one source that everybody copied each other. It's super normal to do. Um, so we need to find independent uses either in different traditions uh, or completely different sources um, where they're not quoting each other. So you have to be a little bit of a detective. And there are good classes. I've heard of some really great classes. Also, a lot of your poisonous plants are not ingested and are used for spiritual work. That's very normal. Um, and, and I will say from personal experience, almost dying from aconite poisoning. Boy, it's Bob killing himself day. <laughs> um, even touching a poisonous plant um, can get you in trouble. And, and I was growing some aconite and I was giving, I was doing my favorite class, herb drug interactions. And this aconite, this monk's hood plant, had just gotten into bloom. And they have this amazing royal blue flower. And it's monk's hood. And so it's this cow-like flower. And I was just entranced by it. So I'm literally playing with it. And I was found out there was a bunch of um, new pharmacy student grads that uh, were coming to my herb drug interaction class. And I got a little nervous. And I was like, all right, I got to do something different because here's some really smarty smarts coming. You know, those are PhDs and all that. And so I, I said, you know, I'm going to talk about how just because it has a particular Latin name on a label, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's dangerous or wrong because of the way we process. And so we have things like Sao Wu, which is unprocessed processed aconite, which is very dangerous to take internally. And then we have things like Futsa, and Futsa has been processed in Pauzer, and that's considered safe to take internally. Um, so I, I got some futsa and I put it there and I brought in my monk's hood flower. And the whole time I'm talking, I'm talking about this process. I'm like, la, 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 and I'm petting it. And then I reached in and took out the uh, safe one. And I'm talking about it and I'm talking about it. And I had the toxin from the aconite all over my hands and processed and put it all over the other stuff. And then I drank it. 
or ate it, I forget which, it was too long ago and it obviously damaged my brain. <laughs> and I very quickly figured out that I had um, poisoned myself. And luckily I, I had been taught what the sensation of aconite poisoning is. It's actually a warmth and tingling that usually starts at your feet and slowly works up your body. And if it makes it to your uh, diaphragm, to your heart and lungs, they stop and you die. And so it, um, I started to notice the warmth and tingling um, because I didn't wash my hands. Note to self, always wash your hands or wear gloves if you're working with anything from cayenne pepper to um, toxic plants. And so it started to, it got to my thighs, was just coming up to my waist and I, I figured out what was going on. And uh, I was still lecturing at this time and uh, the show must go on. And I remember that um, there two antidotes that I can think of off the top of my head. One is ginger and one is licorice. And I happened to have this really good concentrated uh, ginger. And so I was like, and if I had happened to poison myself, I could just open these capsules up and ingest it. And I did. And almost immediately it stopped advancing up my body and started to go back down my legs and retreat. So I'm still alive to tell about it. And it's really nice that I know what aconite poisoning feels like. But don't try this at home, kids. Um, so <laughs> it is important that when we're talking about toxic things that we use so much caution with it. I know Renee talks about that she was, um, she grows the Torah and um, she was harvesting a bunch for something I don't even know, that just the act of harvesting a lot of it and trimming it back, that um, she had a, a very near death experience that was more hallucinatory than actual death, but it was not a good time from what uh, she tells us. So. Um, so, yes, poisonous plants are fascinating. Don't eat them. <laughs> before we go to the online question we had before, mm -hmm. um, book recommendations on cooking or making herbal medicine. Um, yes, yeah, so making herbal medicine, even though it's, it, it is not the most current book, The Medicine Maker's Handbook by James Green, I think you can find that on our website. We have mm -hmm. some recommended books. Um, that is truly my favorite favorite medicine and Thomas has got a medicine making but lots of other people have medicine making books but James Green's book Medicine Maker's Handbook is still the uh, only book I use uh, for medicine making and teaching medicine making out of um, it it's very much uh, a great writer that it's actually entertaining to read uh, very lighthearted but it gives all of the all of the different types of medicine and products you could possibly hope to make uh, in great detail, um, lots of charts and so forth in the back. Um, but he also kind of gives two methods for everything. And, and I really like that part. So there is the, I'm going to make this product for sale um, to the general public and it must be exactly the same every single time. So there's a very precise way of basically math um, on how we measure and process everything so that you get consistency in your product, which if you're selling a tincture or a salve, you want it to be the same so people come back and buy it and they get the same product they did the first time. But then there's, I, I call it Kitchen Witch. Um, it's the way I cook in the kitchen. I don't follow directions well in anything. Um, <laughs> and, and, so I have a tendency to like, if I'm making soup, well, sure, you're supposed to throw a pan. And it's like, oh, well, what'll happen if I throw this in? And it's like, oh, I bet you this curry will be good in there. And so I don't measure a lot, but there's some basic ideas. So he talks about both the very precise, um, almost pharmaceutical approach to precisely, consistently make your medicine and kind of some general guidelines in this uh, more chef than cook kind of process. Okay, just ignore the, that is not the end of days bass. going by. It's just a really <laughs> loud bass going by on the street out there. So hopefully y'all couldn't hear that. Um, so yeah, he, he's number one. And that said, you know, there, there are lots of other great books and the other great medicine makers, but I think James Green's book goes back to almost the 70s or 80s and still my fave. Any more, do we have more questions? Because if do. not, I'll just talk crazy talk for we a do, while. We do, we do. So this is mm. from a midwife, um, mm -hmm. and one of her clients has a severely overactive sex drive um, that interferes with everyday life and has led to several ruined relationships. 
it's overactive when she starts menstruation and ends right after ovulation and then she has no sex drive at all after <coughs> excuse me after ovulation until huh. menstruation begins um menstruation is normal she's 32 years old each eats a whole food omnivore diet um side note is as a midwife she's the case is difficult for her because she doesn't feel like the person's sex drive is abnormal um but it's not morally acceptable in her culture and religion yeah they're like there's so many things that i want to say about this so i'll i'll go i'll start with the 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 basics and it's always interesting when you look at the timing and so the and I'm going to say hypersexuality, uh, excessive sex drive, but I don't think that's really correct because that's almost a uh, societal norm. Um, I I don't get a chance to watch it much anymore, but there was something about um, if you've ever seen the show, Adam ruins everything. Um, it's I've seen anything ever about it. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, and there was somehow this came up in one of his. I think he was t talking about sex ed and so forth. And like, who decides what too much libido is and what amount of sex we're supposed to have? There's nobody there, you know, with, with a, a, a measuring stick as for men or women to what that is. And so I think the first thing we have to look at from more of a physiological standpoint, when we look at sex drive, what, what is that not sexual function or anything, but literally that drive to reproduce, um, we're looking at testosterone as that primary thing to, you know, make us horny, to, to have that libido. And part of that, you know, both men and women have it. And in women in particular, it is not uncommon to see higher than normal and sometimes well outside of the normal high range um, of testosterone with uh, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And classically, we look at that particular disorder is oftentimes heavier set, um, uh, increase in facial hair or arm hair, um, and with difficulty in pregnancy, although it usually tends to be easier to get pregnancy a little bit later in life, like late 20s, early 30s. Um, usually a, a, an, un, a, a painful menses, and obviously in the case of, um, I don't know if I said this, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, uh, frequently the cysts may burst, which can be super painful and so forth. That said, that's the main type of PCOS. There is another type of PCOS where we don't see some of those characteristics the, uh, it will only show up on an ultrasound, but we might still see the elevated testosterone. And so the classic way we think of PCOS may not be there. There's, it's always interesting because of the association of when that uh, higher libido is there, is happening on a particular schedule with the menses, does make it imply that there is a hormonal imbalance of sorts there. Um, now ignore everything I just said. Uh, <laughs> that's more of the physiological ideas behind it. Um, it. It's always a fascinating subject because this is talked about in, in Chinese medicine a lot. And I'm, I'm going to do my best to um, make, have this make sense to people who don't know Chinese medicine. We, we talk about substances, energetics of the body, and the, the ones most of us are familiar with that we've heard, and the way we think of them in the body is yin and yang. And so the yang, the Y-A-N-G, is the warming, hot nature of the body, and yin is the cooling, moistening uh, properties of the body. And in a perfect world that doesn't exist, those things are in perfect balance. So we look at the yin yang symbol, the Tai Chi symbol is actually what it's called, uh, and, and grand ultimate. It is the explanation of all things in, in the human body, in the animal body, in the world, and in the universe are all theoretically explained by those concepts. 
But the reality is they're not in perfect balance in most of us. And so those imbalances will exhibit specific symptoms. And our ability to recognize when there's too much of one or not enough of the other uh, is kind of the magic of, of being an herbalist, especially a Chinese herbalist. So the two things that we tend to see, well, let me back that up. We, we associate libido, sex drive with the yang energy of, and because we say yang is more masculine, and so that masculine yang energy is our libido. There's two ways that that can get out of whack. One, when there's just too much of it. The other is when there's not enough yin. When there's not enough cooling, moistening, nourishing fluids of the body. And so the yang may be normal. Their testosterone levels may be normal. But those other, whether it's a hormone or whatever, isn't there to restrain it. So the yang appears in comparison to the yin, may appear to be excessive. And the fact that she's not horny constantly, that it's only part of it, my guess is that's actually what's going on. That, uh, you know, either it's A, PCOS, in which case that's a whole different uh, conversation, or that literally her libido stems from her need to be moistened and nourished better. And, you know, without going to the deep, dark diagnostics of all of it, um, doing a uh, basal body temperature to track the temperature throughout the whole cycle. And certainly for a midwife, I'm, I'm guessing you know what a BBT is. Um, and see if there's something that's not matching up through that cycle that is either excessive or deficient. Um, if she's dealing with things like night sweats or hot flashes, that might be indicative of uh, that there is a yin deficiency. If she's tending towards constipation, uh, vaginal dryness, which would really suck to have that combination. Um, and if her hands and feet are warmer than her arms, those would all point towards that um, deficiency of the yin. The greater question is, kind of what you said at the end of the question you sent in. Like when you had a frank conversation with your client, the idea of you were like, no, that sounds kind of normal and healthy. But um, wherever she she is originally from that, uh, that society in, and unfortunately, that's in every society. Um, that somehow sex and desire is bad or evil um, and has to be quashed. And, you know, if we go back and look at some of the reasons for um, everything from circumcision to uh, clitoral ectomies, it was to somehow quash sex drive and desire in people. Um, and if you're really bored, um, uh, research um, circumcision and Kellogg, as in Kellogg cereal. Um, he was one of the major drivers outside of uh, two religions for circumcision ubiquitously through the US from the 1900s on. <laughs> Sorry, it's useless trivial facts of the day. <laughs> it's fascinating. I Googled it myself. I didn't believe it when I read it. I was like, nope. Um, so, there is a challenge if her libido is actually normal, but people around her, her significant other, are, are feeling somehow threatened uh, by it. Boy, that's a harder argument, and we don't want to screw up her hormones if they're actually great. Um, and so that would, I would say, counseling would be the, the greater help or find a better partner. Um, <laughs> it, if it is, if it's, you can find, and all of us are imbalanced in some form or fashion. If you do start to recognize that there's an imbalance, looking at those herbs that can be helpful in 
um, cooling, moistening, and nourishing uh, may be helpful in trying to um, correct the imbalance so that she's feeling more in control of her libido. And sometimes that's literally what it is um, that that can be the challenge as well. And sorry, I used to teach sex ed for eighth grade kids. So uh, way too many conversations along these lines. Um, especially with societal norms that somehow masturbation is not okay. And um, allowing her to feel comfortable with her own body, where if a partner's libido and her libido don't match, and that's so freaking common, um, that she can find a way to meet those uh, needs uh, of uh, pleasure or release or however she wants to describe it and not feel bad about it, not to feel guilty. Um, and that's hard. If she grew up in a culture where that was an evil thing, um, that's going to be a harder sell. And that might be um, getting her to work either with you, if she, you know, uh, as a midwife that she trusts you and you can say medical words at her. Uh, <laughs> But also, it would be super appropriate to refer her out to a counselor of some sorts that really specializes uh, it, with those issues because it is a unique conversation um, that not everybody's really comfortable having. Obviously, I'm doing this for a permanent recording. I have no problem saying these things. Um, and, and it's a tough one. I, I've had uh, a number of clients, both male and female, where that's a huge issue and it's more common than I think uh, people talk to because there's shame associated with it and shame sucks um, so we don't talk a lot about flower essences um, but you might uh, do some research with flower essences and um, if it's not something you're familiar with or comfortable with find a practitioner yeah, with flower essences and those are the Bach flower remedies um, there's other ones but that's the one she's easiest to find that there are a number of combinations that can be created around the uniqueness of, of her um, to allow her to get away from the shame that she may be experiencing with with that in general um, but, you know, it sounds like you've had good conversations already about, no, you're normal. Everybody else needs to get the, their head out of the dirt. Um, because for a happy, healthy person, libido is normal. Uh, desire is normal. And everybody has slightly different levels, whether that's based on their own societal, what they believe to be normal, uh, to their uh, testosterone and other hormone levels. Uh, and, and so letting folks know it's okay and there's different ways uh, to meet your own needs and desires uh, is certainly okay. Um, it's funny, usually we get people asking for herbs for more libido, especially the guys, but women as well. Um, and the, there are some that are thought to help reduce libido. Um, the primary one for that is uh, Vitex, um, once known as monk's pepper, and was specifically used for uh, helping to reduce the celibate monks. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and Vitex specifically screws with progesterone. Um, and so unless they actually threw BBT or other testing, um, and I actually prefer uh, the basal body temperature testing um, t for women in particular because their hormones change throughout their cycle from day to day. I don't feel like a single blood value can accurately tell what's going on hormonally in their body. Um, when we start looking at luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, progesterone, estrogen, blah, 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 and all the different forms and byproducts as they break down, screw that. The BBT is more accurate than, um, you know, one day's blood work. 
Um, so unless there is reason to suspect a progesterone deficiency, I wouldn't actually use uh, Vitex, but know that that's what you're going to Google and find out. Um, I, I would say the Bach flower remedies might actually be the most effective approach. And they're herbal slash homeopathic in their approach and oftentimes deal with uh, emotional, spiritual, behavioral, identity kind of issues with all of that. <sighs> Did we get all the questions? We got all the Holy questions. Holy crap, Oli. Yes. Sorry, a, got all I serious there towards the end. I thought for what you could discuss because we have a mm -hmm. bunch of clients who come through every day and have no idea how to prepare. So oh. Maybe just a little crash course on how do you decide how to prepare which types of herbs. Oh, yeah, that, I heard you telling yeah, that woman today, that actually. Almost every day. That's a times great a day. question. So um, the uh, question was like, how do we decide what to do with these plants? And, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of doing infusions or decoctions, and there are certainly tinctures and all that. Take a class. You should take a class on that too. Um, but you know, if you're like, I'm just going to go down to the herb store and I'm going to buy some herbs and I want to make some teas. In general, when we do an infusion, which is, uh, you know, like, I, I won't bother to nuance you between tea and infusion. They're the same, except tea is only camellia synthesis, i.e. green or black tea. Um, and all the other herbs we talk about an infusion. And those infusions can be hot or cold, long or short, and lots of other variations which are interesting. But as a general generic rule, leaves and flowers, we do infusions. Um, if it's very aromatic, like think mint, those are a lot of volatile oils, it should always be covered if there's volatile oils. And we tend to do shorter infusions with those. And if we're talking root, bark, seeds, we tend to do decoction. And decoction is short for boil the crap out of it. Um, mushrooms always need to be processed in some way, and that is usually decoction. So raw mushrooms are yummy um, in a spinach salad, yay. Um, but ultimately, that's just a bulking agent that you're just going to poop out the same mushroom you put in. And they, in order to get all the good stuff, the polysaccharides and all that kind of cool stuff out of there, actually more boiling the better. Unless your roots or barks have a lot of volatile oils, which some do, you're not going to do damage or harm. Uh, by actually simmering or boiling that for a long period of time. You're actually breaking a lot of those nutrients out of the cell wall and making them accessible uh, for you once you strain them. Other processing you can do is you can grind things into a powder. The downside with powders though is that it exposes it to the air and so it oxidizes, it breaks down faster. So bigger chunks better for buying and storage and then breaking that up before you do an infusion or decoction. So leaves and flowers, uh, great as a tea or an infusion, um, and root and bark and seeds, boil the crap, and mushrooms, boil the crap out of them. Um, there's lots of nuance to all of that and obviously fancier stuff, but that's a really safe rule of thumb. For the infusions, generically, I always say just uh, cover it, just in case you don't know. And there's fancy versions of that, like, but wait, I need to put mint or some other very aromatic thing, but I also want all these roots and barks. So you boil the crap out of your roots and barks, you take it off the heat, you throw your mint in, and wait 15 minutes while it cools off, and strain it all off, and you're great. So it's easy to combine them, it's just a question of paying attention and timing it. Um, you can even boil the crap out of your root and barks and seeds, strain those all off. It's still hot, so throw your uh, volatile leaves and flowers in there and you can let that steep covered for as long as you like. So there's, there's rules, just read James Green's books. There's no rules. 
so we can mix and match and kind of combine things as we need to and certainly you could make two separate you can do an infusion and decoction and then mix portions of those together um, you can oh crap i bought two more too much of this i can make a tincture and add that into your infusion or your decoction after you're done as a way to um, create the formulas to fix the imbal energetic imbalances or to address the symptoms that you've got the questions we got so many wonderful questions both online but so many of you sent them in ahead of time i love that um i have no idea whenever the last friday of the month is for november i think that's around turkey day but i think we can make that happen um and uh please check us out online i will post this on youtube shortly uh feel free to share it with your friends um, love the questions coming in, in uh, ahead of time and always fine to post those questions in the chat as we go along. We usually can catch them. So thank you all up. I uh, thank you all so much for joining me on your Friday evening. And I hope I see you in here in this or any of the other wonderful classes in person or online. So y'all go enjoy your Friday night. Bye. Yeah. Say bye, Trisha. Oh, can't see me. Yep, oh there we are. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, all. all right. da, da, da.